Hello, fiber friends, and welcome to my YouTube channel where we talk about all things spinning and knitting, and knitting with our hand spun and fiber prep and all of that. My name is Kristen, and you can find me on Instagram as Stitched Vintage. Um, and today we are going to be chatting. So it's an episode of Spin and Chat where you spin or knit or craft and I chat about questions that you've asked me about just fiber and spinning and different things. So hopefully you have a fun project that you're working on. And um, what else? Oh, if you have a question and you want to chat about it, maybe next time you can, there will be a link in the description, but it's also just stitchedvintage.com. And when you go there, the question box like automatically pops up and you just pop your question in there about spinning or fiber. Um, I wouldn't consider myself like a spinning or a knitting teacher. So, but like knitting with hand spun, um, like if you have questions regarding that, that's really, I don't want to say my expertise because I'm not an expert, but like that's been a huge focus for me. Um, so if you have questions, I would love to try and help. Um, okay. Why am I holding this? This is the first question. So question number one, can you buy fleece that's already been washed and skirted? And the answer is yes. So I bought this already washed and ready to go. Um, it's harder. I feel to find, well, not harder. Cause I mean, you can look on Etsy and they will pop up. Um, but it's not as, there's not as much of a variety than if you were buying just raw fleece. So you can search on Etsy and you can find some, usually it's more like sample sizes. You're usually paying like by the ounce instead of by the pound. It just depends. So I've had this for a while. I bought this because I wanted to work from fleece, but I was really scared to wash. I had just heard horror stories about the smell. And so I was just really nervous that it was just going to be so bad. Um, and then also just like reading like the scouring and like scouring gone wrong. And like, it just, there's a lot of things out there that can scare you away from working from fleece. I will tell you, I have zero issues scouring. Like I just watch YouTube videos and um the smell is not bad like i've had some really disgusting fleece and it just smells like a farm i mean if you have been to a farm and walked into a barn that's what it smells like so if like that's a smell you really can't handle then process like washing scouring a fleece might not be for you that is not a smell that really bothers me maybe because i grew up in the country i don't know um but it just smells sheepy and barney and I love it. So, and this doesn't, this is washed. So it does not, I mean, it has a sheepy smell. Moving on, you will pay for that process. Like that's the only other thing, but like, I feel like it's worth it because it is a long process. Scouring a fleece like is a long process. Like it takes time and effort and space and all of that. So you are going to pay for that. But on the flip side of that, so when you're buying a raw fleece, like let's say it's a six pound fleece, a lot of that is like VM, like vegetable matter, sometimes poop. <laughs> Hopefully not if it was skirted well enough. Um, but also the lanolin, like you can use, lose a lot of the weight of your fleece in the washing process. Um, so and fleece is usually bought by the pound. So if you're, you know, buying, you're spending and buying a six pound fleece and let's say it's, you know, $20 a pound. So you're spending, why can't I do math? Why do I homeschool my kids if I can't do that in my brain? You're spending a pretty penny, right? Um, hundred and over $120, right? <laughs> I think that's right. Maybe I should stop this and re-record. <laughs> Anyways, it's been a long day. Um, 
a lot of that is lanolin. So then like when you're finished, you only have like four pounds. I mean, sometimes maybe you'll have five, five and a half, like closer, but in my experience in washing fleece, you lose almost like at least a quarter of it usually. Sometimes way more. I had one fleece where I lost, like I only had a quarter of like when I weighed it, when it was finally done. Anyways, so this doesn't have that. So this is all ready to be processed. And there may be a bit of second cuts in here. If I comb it, like there will be combing waste and, um, you know, there is vegetable matter in here like a bit, but for the most part, like what I'm paying for is what I'm getting. So that's the plus side to it. Um, I do kind of wish like now that I'm thinking about it, like I do enjoy washing a fleece, but it would be nice to just buy one already washed and just play with it immediately. Um, okay, so yes, you can, but they're harder to find, they're harder to come by, and there's not as much variety. Maybe that will change as more people get into fleece. Like I can see like more Etsy shops popping up and like going to these, you know, whether it be auctions or like the fiber festivals and buying fleece and washing them and then breaking it apart and selling it that way. Um, because I do think more people would maybe like spin from fleece if that was an option. So hopefully that helps. Okay. Let's put this away. Okay. Question number two. And you will probably know my answer. Um, but the question was double treadle versus single treadle. Like what do you recommend? Like one versus or one over the other. And you won't know until you sit and you spin it both. Um, like what you prefer. There's a few things. One, a double treadle. So this is just the foot pedals. Like, is there two? So your feet are going up and down or is there just one where just one foot is going? Um, the cool thing about a double treadle is you can just pedal with one foot if you want. And it then becomes a single treadle. <laughs> um, other than that, um, I, I feel like for me personally, I want a double treadle because it evenly um, like disperses like the movements, right? I'm not having one leg that's getting overworked. Um, they're both doing it, especially like if it was when we're talking about some of like the heavier wheels um, where it can take a lot to get going and then keep going. If that's just one leg, it can be a workout. Um, and while you could switch, like, I mean, I guess it depends the style of wheel, because if it's one treadle, then you're having to twist your butt, you know, if you're treadling with your left leg and like, that's where the pedal is and that leg gets tired and you're like, okay, let's switch my right. Then you're going to be like shifting, but like trying to stay. And then that can cause problems. I don't know. Um, so for me, I prefer a double treadle. I just find, um, I'm able to not, my legs don't get as tired. Um, and if I really wanted to just treadle with one foot, maybe to slow down, maybe I'm doing long draw and both feet just get going too fast and I want to slow down. Like I can take one foot off and then just use, you know, one of the pedals and just do a single treadle. Does that make sense? Hopefully that helps. Not helpful. I know because I'm like, well, maybe you should try them. Um, but any wheel you sit and spin at, like you're going to be good at. It's just practice. Uh, when I went from, cause I had a bullfrog, Spinolution Bullfrog, and I went to the Spinolution Echo with the accelerator. Um, it was, while they're made by the same company, like they are different wheels, they spin different. And when I sat in my Spinolution, I was like, oh, I don't think I'm gonna like this. But the more I sat at it, I was like, oh, I love it. And then I would go and sit, you know, after 
using the echo for a while i pull out the bullfrog and i'm like oh no i don't like this so whatever you sit at and spin at the most like you're just it's going to become natural for you so um i do like i would recommend a double treadle but someone may disagree with me and that's totally fine <laughs> Um, and the only reason why, like my main reason is just ergonomics. You know, we don't, like you see that in knitting, like carpal tunnel, like wrist pain, joint pains. Um, it can happen in spinning, hip, knee, the ankle. Um, we just want to keep things like the less like strenuous we can be over these like small repetitive motions that we're doing. I feel like the more long-term, um, like we won't have issues in like the long run. Does that make sense? So hopefully that makes sense, but I don't know. Moving on. Um, question three, have you spun painted cotton top or have you ever had a fluff up cotton that's been compacted? I had to do that. I forgot this was a question because I have been trying to record this all week and it's Friday and I'm just sitting down. Um, okay. So top, cotton top, is like this. Um, this is not painted, um, but it comes kind of like this. And you see, this is not cotton. <laughs> um, but as an example, when I have a braid that's kind of been compacted, I can like pre-attenuate it, pre-draft it out and kind of open things back up, right? When we have cotton, you can't really do that because the fibers are extremely short. Um, like extremely short. That's not going to show you. Maybe if I hold it down here. Like they're so tiny. Um, so pre-drafting something like this is just, you're going to be breaking it. So I've also not really found, like I've had this cotton for a while. I have had some Egyptian cotton. I mean, it had sat like um, air compressed out of it for like almost a year or more. Lord knows how long beforehand. And um, it was fine. Like I, I don't find cotton... Um, handles the same way as wool when it comes to like needing to fluff it back up. What I do find is that it depends which end you're spinning from. So if you've got some, like a sliver, right? That I think that's what, like, it's not cotton top. It's like cotton sliver, right? Honestly, I don't know. I could be making that up. Um, it definitely depends which end of the sliver you're spinning from. Um, some people say that it doesn't. I spun enough cotton now from different shops in different places that it 100% does. It's, it makes a huge difference. So if you're finding the drafting is super uneven, it's not drafting nicely, try spinning it from the other end and see if that helps. 10 times out of 10 times, that is what it is for me. Um, and the other thing I can say is, so I will take this, I will like pull some cotton off and then I will like break it in half and we're not like fluffing it up. That's just, it's less, less is more. I feel when I'm spinning cotton, I don't want to have like this whole thing and it's too much. Um, so I'll just like break it in half and then just take this and I have my top leaves and I will spin that way. What I think might be happening, and I'm not 100% sure because, like I said, I've not spun, like I've not purchased painted cotton, um, but I do find with wool that, like, sometimes the dyer can, like, kind of felt the wool. Um, it doesn't happen often, but I have had a few that were, like, starting to felt. I was able to like draft through it and like attenuate it and make it all work fine. Um, but that can happen with wool. That's not going to happen with cotton. But what I find happens most of all, like especially, what color was that? 
I want to say is it, it's either the reds or the blues. One of those tend to be a stickier dye and maybe it's just whatever brand, maybe a, a, a brand. I'm not a dyer, so I don't know. I just know that when I did all that spinning for Tour de France, Tour de Fleece, Tour de France, Tour de Fleece, um, I was finding specific colors and I want to say it was the blues. Um, especially those deep, like deep indigo blues were sticky. It was, the fiber wasn't felted. It was just sticky. And it was only when I got to like those parts. And that's when I was like, I think it's the dye. Like, I think this dye is just a sticky dye because like, I don't, I don't know. Anyways, so that could be what's happening. Like maybe whatever the dye that was used on that cotton sliver is stickier and it's just, it's causing those fibers not to draft as nicely because there's, the dye has made them now a bit stickier than they were. Does that make sense? So it's gonna be like, dye's not sticky. And I will disagree. <laughs> I think it is, sometimes. It could be a specific brand, it could be a color. I wanna say it's blue, but it could be the red but I'm pretty sure it's, it was the blue. Yes. Cause I spun a lot of blue. I want to say it was in those blue sections and like all of them, I was like, this is sticky. It's not felted, but it's not drafting as nicely as the rest of it. Anyways, moving on. I'm like beating a dead horse now. So that's my tip is, um, switching sides, like the end you're spinning from and smaller. So like, tearing a chunk off and if you need to splitting that chunk in half and spinning that way okay sticking with the cotton theme i should have washed my glasses i can see i must have smudged them um examples of how to spin cotton and i don't really understand this question but we're gonna go with it um twofold one i only spin on my talk leaves which is this little fun guy. And this is the bowl I use to um, spin on. And I just, oh, I broke it. I just spin, I just sit and spin. And um, it's been a hot minute since I spun cotton. And that's it. You can spin it on a wheel. I have, I prefer spinning it on my Tockley spindles. Um, it gets going pretty quick once you get the hang of it. So I like that. So that is how I spin. Um, moving on because we have talked about spinning cotton and wool. So then I was like, well, maybe they're talking about like those examples. So I do have some examples. And I'm excited to chat about them because if you've watched like any other like of my videos, then you know, okay, we'll just sit you there, that I am really trying to figure out a way to make blend, to blend and spin a 50-50 cotton yarn, cotton wool yarn. Yes. And because you can't buy like pre-blended like roving or top or anything. Um, it's not really something that's in the market. And I live in Florida. It is almost September. It is still over 90 degrees. It feels like over a hundred outside. Like it's still really warm. So I would like to play with a 50, 50, like cotton wool <clears throat> yarn, excuse me, that uh, will just make my life a bit easier here in Florida, like wearing knit things. I will say after, I think I talked about in the last, in like the uh, like podcast episode or whatever, I guess we're calling them podcasts now because I don't know, they're not, I'm not a podcaster, but it is what it is. When I talked about the super wash wall and how it's not supposed to be as hot, da, 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 and it like soaks in all the heat. 
Um, so I'm a little nervous about a 50-50 wool cotton blend knit as a top for this summer. It'll be fine in the winter um, and like fall and spring, like that'll be great. But I'm I'm a little hesitant to say that it'll, it'll be good for summer uh, just because it is so hot here. Maybe I should buy one and knit something. No, because I do. I want a 50-50. Anyways, on topic, cotton cards are how I do that. And that's these. These are cotton hand cards. These are the Ashford. Um, and you just like, oops, you just like put it on and blend it together. I believe I've talked a bit. I don't know if I have actually. I'm pretty sure I have. Um, I've tried a few different things. Um, I've tried cutting the wool that led to like super um, pokey, itchy. And this was wool that I had spun before that's super soft and great. And then when I cut it and combined it, blended it, blend it, blended it. Mm. When I blended it <laughs> with the cotton and uh, knit a sample, it was super itchy, which is odd, but that was a no-go. Also talked about the um, Icelandic fleece I have, like separating the tog and the thal and combining the thal, right? The thal is the like inner, like downy, super soft with the cotton. That's still an option. I still have that fleece that I need to work through. Um, anyways, so I decided that I wanted to pull out my hog island roving that I've had for a long time. Um, I got this because I was doing the passport, the like rare breeds. Come on, Kristen, think of what it's called. Um, anyways, I got this and it's been sitting and look at how yellow it is. It is a very yellow, yellow roving. So it's been sitting. It's not a horrible prep, but it's not the best prepped fiber um, that I've seen, which is fine. Like I'm not complaining, um, but it's not spinning a perfect, not a perfect, it's nothing perfect. It's not, spinning is not as easy with this as it should be. Um, there's a lot of neps in it, which is probably could be because it's just a fine fleece. Um, they could be second cuts and it's, I mean, this is like super compacted. Anyways, I try, I sampled a bit with it and it wasn't, there's a point, stick with me. <laughs> I, I sampled a bit and then I was like, this isn't what I want. Um, I have quite a bit of it and I want to do like spin it all and have at least a sweater's quantity, probably more, um, and then possibly dye it because this is not my <laughs> color. Um, but I wanted to spin the yarn and then choose a pattern and then pick the colors and dye it. I have some, not a dyer, I've not dyed anything other than like tie dyeing shirts, but I do have like plant dyes, like plant, um, powders to dye. Anyways, that's way in the future. But I was thinking about it and playing with this. And I was like, what if I comb? What if I pull out my combs, which are these, and I just comb it, which is an extra step. One that you usually don't have to do, like when you buy already prepped fiber. But again, this is not the best prep. And um, like it might lead itself to... A, really rustic woolen yarn um but i don't want the little tiny naps and stuff in it so i did i sat and i went through and i combed just a just a bit um we got some pretty little nestlets in here okay we're talking about cotton i promise um so i had done that and I had so much, like there was so much combing waste. For half of whatever I like, I lashed onto these, it was waste. Um, 
but it's not bad waste. Like I was pulling it off and I was like, but it's not bad. It's just like the extremely short, like naps. Um, and like, you can kind of see them in there. Um, and combing waste is fine. Like any waste is fine because it can go in the garden as mulch. Uh, that's what I do with it all. But I'm like, this is actually really nice. And then I was like, what if, because these are such short, teeny tiny bits. What if I took it and I took my raw cotton. So this is raw cotton. Um, and I have a ton of it. What if I took it and I took this and we combined them on the cotton cards? I wonder what we would get. So I did that. And, um, let's not mix things up. And, oh no, what I do with the sample I spent? think the book that my phone is on is on top of that yarn. Okay. Anyway, so we did a sample and it turned out great. Not my favorite because the hog Island waste has naps in it. So it's a little nappy. Um, I would say like a rustic looking, it's super, it's extremely soft but it's more of like a rustic looking, not feel, um, yarn. So like that is a possibility. I will probably, cause it's just a small sample. Where are you? Okay. This is the, this is just hog Island. Where did the cotton? So that's just my sample of the hog Island, um, that I spun. Dang it. <laughs> All right. Maybe I will show you next time if I find it. It was such a little sample. I was like, I have to save it. Mm, I'm pretty sure it's under that book. Anyways, I'm going to do more. So as I work my way through combing the hog island to spin for a sweater, I will save the waste and then slowly combine that waste with the raw cotton and we will make a larger sample and be able to like knit with it and see what it makes. Okay. So be on the lookout in a couple years when that happens. Um, okay. Let's put this away. So that is how all that long way to say is that is how, wait, is this it? This is it. I found it. So this is a sample of that hog Island waste and, um, raw cotton. And you can see it's neppy, um, from all the neps in there, but it is really, it worked. Um, and it's, kind of stretchy, not, not a ton, but way more than what cotton would be. Um, so we are going to play with that at some point. The other thing that I wanted to talk about in, um, ways to spin cotton is another 50-50 wool cotton blend that I did. And I knit a little swatch and I am obsessed with this yarn. Um, I'm so happy with it. And, um, if you want to spin a like 50, 50 wool cotton yarn, I'm hoping you will try this and report back and tell me like what you think. Um, because I am just so happy with how this turned out. So I had done the combo spins. And I've talked about the combo spins. People have asked before, like combining different, like, um, the words, words, words. <laughs> I need to take a sip of water and fix my brain for a second. Pre 
breeds of sheep. That's the word. <laughs> um, combining them. Like I've talked about it. I've done it like in any compost bin I've done. It's usually like two to three different like breeds of sheep. And I've not found an issue with it. Um, there was one that the first combo spin I did, which wasn't, they were both the same, um, like dyed colorways. They were just dyed on different. One was dyed on Cormount, one was dyed on BFL. I was super nervous to then ply those two together because BFL is like a longer staple. It's more drapey. And then Cormo is just like so bouncy and squishy. So I was afraid that it would spiral ply. And I got a beautiful yarn that is this yarn um this is the um contrast color in the illuminate that i've shared um and there's a picture of it on instagram i've also since ripped that out but we won't talk about that <laughs> um anyways so i was thinking what if so i had i'm so long-winded I had some cotton singles that were just sitting. Um, I hadn't applied them, hadn't, hadn't done anything with them. Um, and they were just sitting for when I spun more cotton, they'd be added on to that. And uh, eventually we would just apply them together. So I saw them and I was like, what if I applied those with a wool? That would be one ply cotton and one ply with wool and that would be a 50-50 yarn. They're just not pre-blended. They're just plied together. And I was nervous because I was like that. I decided to use Cormo. I have a bunch of um, Cormo robing. I think it's robing. I don't think it's top. It might be top. No, it's robing. Maybe it's top. <laughs> um, I have a bunch of it. And it's so soft and amazing. And it's a beautiful prop. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to spin just a bit. I spun those singles and then I applied them together. And then we swatched for the Ingrid top by, I will put it in the comments because I don't remember. But look, I'm so happy. <laughs> um, this is the, so I, you're not gonna be able to see it because my face, but there's so much stretch to this yarn. It's so stretchy, I love it. Um, and I don't know if you're going to be able to see, but I was super nervous that it would like spiral ply because one's so like pointy and springy and the other's like, so not, but it made, and like, there's so much stretch. Like it's so stretchy. Um, I did make a note that I would, this is all of my sample yarn. So when I do start that project and then I go finish the yarn and go to knit this top to do another um, swatch and go down in needle size because um, I think I need to go down in needle size. But if you're interested in a 50-50 wool cotton, spin yourself one ply of wool, one ply of cotton, and boom, you have it. Um, okay. So I don't know what that would like if we had a, like, if you wanted to dye it, how that would look though. Cause wool and cotton, I think take dyes different. Anyways. So those are some ideas on how I like spun cotton, like played, um, with, with that super long winded way to answer how examples of how to spin. If I didn't answer that question, go ahead and ask it again and maybe give me a bit more context. Um, okay. Last question. How do you decide to split and spin a braid? Um, a lot of time at the wheel and understanding there's no right and wrong way. Um, it's all a learning process. Like even now as I'm spinning, like I'm still learning and there's like no wrong way to do it. Um, there will always be more like sheep are going to keep growing their wool. Like dyers are going to keep dyeing it. Like it's going to, like, there's always going to be more. So like, don't be afraid to just try new things. That's what I did with this. I mean, I was kind of nervous. Um, we talked about this in the Tour de Fleece video. Um, but this was when braid, 
I put one half through the drum carter and the other half I just spun. Oh, come on. And you can see they're very different. Um, I was super nervous that I was going to ruin them, um, but I'm happy that I did it because I learned something um, from, from doing that, from taking a braid and putting it through the drum carter and spinning it and seeing, okay, what happens if I don't do that, being able to have the comparison. Um, and you have two really beautiful yarns, but they are different. Like you can see, um, and this would have a purpose and this type would have a purpose, right? This is more like one color and this is more like a spin cycle type, you know, um, color. So yeah. Um, okay. So that's like my preface preface, 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 words are not my strong suit today. Speaking is not, is like, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, and just go with it. I mean, I, there's been plenty of braids where I just like, or I'm ripping and pulling and like, who cares? I'm not color managing. I'm not doing anything. And I've gotten really beautiful yarn. Um, the first thing I do now when I go to spin a yarn um, is I pull the whole thing out. So let's use this as an example. This is a colorway from Nest Fiber. It was April 2022 uh, colorway, uh, part of her like monthly club fiber, fiber, fiber club. And it's the colorway Char, Char, Charmant, Charmanty. Um, and I love it. I believe, no, the following month, it is either this month or the following month was my last club colorway because I just had so many braids and I was like, I need to spin through these before. Like I just, I had, I had to cancel it and I've not purchased any, um, any top, any dyed braids, anything since, since then. Um, I hadn't purchased any like on their own at all that year. And then I canceled this, I believe in May. And we've been doing good. We've been slowly spinning through the stash. Okay, so I'm going to pull it out. And I'm just going to look and see, like, what are the color repeats? Like, what are we working with? Am I, like, if I'm just spinning to spin, my go-to is I'm going to break it. I'm either going to split it in half, like, this way. Or I'm going to go and I'm going to, like, find the halfway point and split it that way and just spin. Because I have no plans. I just want to spin because it will make pretty yarn. Um, if I'm spinning for something or I'm like, okay, I know this is going to be like color work in a yoke or something, then I'm going to see, you know, how quick are these color repeats? Because usually when it's a yoke, it's not very much, you know, like, and you want to see, like, if you want to see all these colors working their way through that yoke, then we're going to have to split it down. Um, so I would split it in half. And then one to one bobbin, I would take this, split it in half again, spin end to end um, with this piece. When that's done, start again here, spin that down, set that bobbin aside, do the next one exactly the same way. Um, I don't know that I would. No. So... How I decide if I'm going to split it in half, like at the halfway point is I match them up and if their ends match, like a lot of times the braids for the most part, like it might be a little off, but the, for the most part, they match like completely. And then I would just break it at the halfway point. Um, this is not one of those. I mean, we would have to come like all the way down here. I'm like, I could manage that and figure that out, but it's another step. Um, so like, that's one example. This is Falkland. So I know I've spun enough Falkland that I know I like to spin it long draw, like over the fold long draw. So that would be my go-to. Um, and from spinning it so much, I know I'm going to start my wheel at 15 to 1. It's about what I like to spin um, Falkland long draw over the fold, like that, I, 
it's probably going to stay there. I may change it. Um, but I'm, that's where I'm starting. Um, if I was spinning Rambouillet, I know I'm going to start my wheel at probably 26 to one ratio and see how that's spinning. If I'm wanting to spin it a bit thicker, I may drop it down to 22 to one, um, and just play from there. The starting point at the wheel is just like you get used to a specific fiber and like what you're going, what your wheel settings are going to be at. Um, uh, for me, and this is so different because everyone's wheel ratios are different. So I have, I've talked about the Echo before. So my ratios on this wheel without having to change anything out, like just sitting down, we go uh, nine to one all the way to 40 to one. Um, for me, sitting down, if I've never spun something, it's my first time, I'm gonna put it 18 to one. Like that's kind of my like, okay, we're starting at zero, 18 to one. Are we going up or are we going down? How high are we going up? And that's kind of where I go from there. Um, so that's like sitting down to spin it um, and, and figuring it out. And sampling, I think sampling's important. Sampling can be really hard when you've only got one braid and you're like, I don't wanna waste it all. Um, my tip would be just breaking off a piece. It doesn't have to be a big piece, but just enough to get a feel for it. Um, and just like pulling off, I would probably pull off like that big of a chunk. Um, to just sample it and see, um, am I wanting a three ply? How is it spinning? What is it look? What does the ply back look like as a two ply? What does the ply back look like as a three ply? I'd make my sample card like from this little and and try and find it. Usually, I can find how I want um it to look. Hmm, should I grab another one? This is getting long. So those are dyed braids, which was the question. Um, let's see. This is another nest. This is November 2021. Hibernate. Also on Falkland. Um, also, can I just say that I love that she doesn't braid her braids? Are they still called braids if they're not braided? They're not. Um... So like this, this is, these are very long. Like it's a lot of blue and then a lot of this rusty and then blue. Like if this was color work, I mean, it's not going to be my whole like right. Um, but it would be a big chunk of blue and a big chunk of this like rusty, bronzy, orangish brown. I would break this up this way in half and I'd set one. If I'm doing a two ply, I prefer a two ply. Maybe yeah, caught on to that. Um, I would break it in half this way and then I would probably split this half for the one bobbin um, probably in half and then in half again. So into fours and spin all of those um, to one bobbin, do the same thing, split this into fours, um, because your girl does not like a fractal. Um, so I would not, that, that's how I would do that. Um, knowing that there would be quite a bit of barber pulling because we're splitting it so many times, like it's not going to match up. Um, some spots will, some spots won't, and um, it will just allow shorter color repeats. Um, the more you break that fiber down, the shorter those color repeats will be, like in color work. Um, so just keep that in mind, like when looking, and uh, hopefully you can see like the difference. Let's hold them both. I mean, they're different colors but hopefully you can see. So you can see on this one, we've got the yellow, the blue, the purple, and then here 
like we've got a little bit of this rust, but then it's all blue. Um, I can see here looking. Um, like there's so many more colors here. So automatically this will have quicker like striping, like repeats than something like this. Like if they were just spun end to end. Does that make sense? Um, okay, those are all the questions. You guys want to see a sneak peek of my Alpen Glow? Um, on my wheel, so I showed you the Rambouillet I was working on in last episode, like of the like monthly vlog podcast thing. <laughs> Um, that's still sitting on my wheel and I've not really touched it. I've really been knitting. It has been a very heavy knitting week. Um, I want to get this sweater done for some reason. Like, I feel like I have to get it done because like I envisioned it, I think for so long and I just want it done and blocked and finished to try on and see if it's what I envisioned in my head. Um, I'm really happy with it so far. I've tried it on a few times. We're down in the sleeves. I tried it on again with like, you know, pretty much where it's at right now. Um, and I think it'll fit. We're having some issues right here on the neck. I think I've talked about that. We have such wide shoulders. <laughs> um, sometimes it can cause this like weird thing on the neck, but I also looked at a lot of the pictures of the Alpen Glow, like the project pictures. And I'm not the only one for this sweater specifically. Like a lot of people is kind of, it cinches up. Like we have like the neckline and then like the ribbing, you know, and then there's like a little spot here and it just kind of like puckers up. I don't know. I was thinking that maybe that issue I'm having has to do with the short row shaping because I have a sweater that has like minimal short row shaping, like in the back. It's also a Raglan, so that's probably what Raglan's fit me better. Um, but it did have, but it wasn't very, like there wasn't a huge wedge there and it fits me so well. And I found, I feel like with Andrea Mowry's patterns, which is who designed the Alpen Glow, that wedge of fabric is pretty significant. So I'm wondering if that's what's causing the weirdness. I don't know. I don't really understand sweater construction a whole lot yet. Um, I did get, so I like this book. I've been flipping through it, trying to understand like the reasons. I like to understand like the why, like how, how is this gonna fit? Like why is it fitting like a certain way? And I feel like once I better understand like sweater construction and why certain things, like why are we putting darts in? I don't need them, but like, what's the reasoning for those? Like, what is that going to fix? By adding darts, like, you know, that's going to help elongate the bottom so it's not like pulling up as it's going out, all of that. Um, so why, like, I know we're adding the short row shaping in the back to kind of raise that up so we're not feeling choked. But why so much? Like if there's just a little wedge with that, like, I don't know. Anyways, this is off topic. Anyways, this is Amy Herzog's ultimate sweater book, The Essential Guide for Adventurous Knitters. If you don't have this and you like knitting sweaters, I recommend it. You probably do if you're a knitter. Um, but A, there's so many sweater patterns in here also. It's like the basics. So like any sweater you could ever want to knit, like you can use this book to knit it. Um, like she talks you through all of it. Um, there's, I mean, uh, like any sweater and not only any sweater, but also knitting it and fingering DK or worsted. Like it's just a really good book. And she explains like all the different like design elements and like sweater construction. So I'm having like a better grasp on it, but not a hundred percent because again, like I've just kind of been skimming it and like, Oh, okay. That makes a bit of sense. But wait, why is that? Um, anyways, so this is taking me down like a whole different 
like rabbit hole. Not that I'm going to be designing anything because there's no way. Um, but I want like to be able to play with math and numbers a bit to make the patterns that I've purchased and am knitting to fit me. Cause there's nothing more frustrating than spending all this time spinning like hours and hours, months, I was spinning for a sweater and then all the time it takes to then knit that sweater only to put it on and be like, it doesn't fit, right? Like it fits, but like I don't, I just don't want that. Like I, it's why we knit so we can make what we want. All right, so I'm not gonna talk too much about this. I've already went on and on, um, but I will in next month's little vlog episode. Um, this is where we are. So we have bound off um, and we're doing both sleeves. So I'm knitting a bit and knitting a bit, knitting a bit and knitting a bit. This has the yarn. That's why it's so bulky. Um, I just use the claw clip, stick the yarn in there and claw clip it when I'm working on the other one. Um, so I think we'll be done uh, maybe this weekend. We'll have to see. Um, it's been busy. My significant other is out of town, so it's just been me single parenting it this week, and we have lots of extracurricular things going on, and it's a lot of running around, so um, I don't know. We'll see. If I have time in the car and whatnot, probably, but the arms are going fast, so I think maybe this weekend, so that would be like a week and a half to knit this lovely sweater. Um, I'm not a fan of this ribbing, <laughs> only because it was such a pain. Um, but, all right, that's all. We will chat more about it next month when it's finished and blocked and on, and I can talk more about it. All right, this was a long one. I only planned on it being a half an hour, but that's okay. I hope you enjoyed your time here. I appreciate you. I appreciate the comments you guys leave, and when you reach out on Instagram, it's so sweet. Um, I'm just super grateful for this community that has just been welcoming and um, just really kind. Um, if you have questions, don't forget that you want to chat about on the next episode of Spin and Chat. Um, you can go to the link in the description or it's just stitchvintage.com and you can pop those in there and we will answer your spinning fiber related questions. So I hope you guys have a great weekend and I will see you next time, next month, probably, maybe.